All right, good afternoon, everyone. We might get started in the interest of time. Uh, thank you all for being here uh, early and on time. It's great to see so many uh, of you here today. Before we get started, um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, Aboriginal Elders past, present, and welcome any of our Aboriginal colleagues here today. Uh, this is Aboriginal land, always has been and, and always will be. So, as I said, welcome to App Workshop number two. Um, yeah, we made it to this point. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to join in for App Workshop 1, you've missed out, but we will be circulating a whole bunch of resources and a recording of the session uh, before Christmas is the time frame I can uh, give you. Um, it just allows us some administrative time. So today uh, we had a bunch of you registered to be here in the room. People will be coming and going throughout the session, and we've got about 130 people uh, registered to join us online today from across uh, the state. Uh, so hello to all of you from us and thank you for joining in. Um, so just some of the housekeeping. Um, if there is a fire alarm, uh, follow us out the exits. They're located down here and at the rear of the room and we'll follow Damon who works uh, here in KPEC out to the evacuation area. Bathrooms uh, if needed are just out this door around past the registration desk along the hall and just up this, this corridor here. And we just ask anyone um, who has a, a phone just to switch those to silent if you need to take them, please. Uh, you can use the exit at the, the rear of the room. So we're really excited. Um, today is going to be a great day. We've got a great bunch of speakers lined up. Um, for those people online. Uh, we do have Slido available for you to put your questions through and we will try and get to those um, if we, we have time to pose questions to our speakers and we will take some from in the room. I asked today if we do throw to the room for questions that you just wait for one of our microphone runners to get to you with a microphone. That just enables the people on live stream to be able to hear the question. So that was a bit of a learning for us from last time. So um, the Slido details are here. Feel free in the room, I suppose, if you want to use them. Um, but it's going to Slido and entering the event code of 3616. Pop your question in there and that will come through to us. So today's talks will finish at 5.30. We've got a fairly strict um, kind of agenda full of great speakers. And at 5.30, we'll wrap up and head out to the foyer uh, for some well-deserved snacks and some networking. So if you can, please stay around. Some of our speakers will stay. Um, so please come and join us. But I will welcome Gianni, who co-chairs the network uh, with me, to um, talk to you a little bit about the lead up to today. Hi, everyone. I um, just wanted to recap um, about the App Workshop series. So hopefully some of you know that it's a three-part series. Today is number two. Um, as part of the New South Wales Innovation Network, which is a collection of innovation and change managers from across the state, we established this series because we found that there was a common need for more support for staff across the state about apps. So we hope you're finding it really useful. Um, our common message, which was the same as last week, if you have an idea, definitely go back and talk to your line manager, gain support from them, um, and then contact um, one of the key professionals on the contact sheet. We'll email that to everyone on live stream. It would also be great then if you could contact myself or Dan and let us know about your idea. The aim is that we'll create a database of all the app ideas, A, so that we can hopefully increase collaboration and also reduce duplication of similar ideas across the state. Um, I think it's a fantastic opportunity to network and meet new people. So hopefully everyone in the room can have a chat and you might be able to create some new ideas together. So with that, I'd like to introduce the first speaker. Um, Ben Reid, who is the Chief Product Officer at Fusion Labs. He has many titles and many roles, and today he's representing Fusion Labs as a company that is an innovation consultancy that builds out software platforms and pilots for medium to large scale organizations. Ben is a full stack product manager with over 22 years experience and 20,000 hours building and commercializing digital products with a specialization in mobile apps and platforms. Ben is a startup founder, angel investor, and startup accelerator specialist 
who is well-known in Sydney um, and has run five startup accelerator programs with Remarkable and Muridi. <laughs> Um, and has worked in the trenches with over 60 early stage technology startups, including health tech, disability and aged care sector. So welcome, Ben. Yeah. <clears throat> 30 people streaming, it's a bit of a sign of the time, isn't it? Yeah. Caught a, um, an Uber over here with a, uh, a guy who's, who has a food truck. He says 85% 80, of his business comes through the Greece now. I'm wondering where he wants to keep the food truck going. So talk about disruption, eh? Um, all right, so um, I'm going to try to keep it to about 20 minutes and open up a bit of time for, for questions. Um, and I'm uh, going to go through these sort of five areas in around the topic of sustainability. Um, I want to talk about sustainability and some of the levels of sustainability. So um, just quickly actually gauge the room. Hands up who's, who's yet to start an app? Who's like in the early stages of it? Who's already got one live? Cool. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the levels of sustainability, um, adoption and spread. So that's sort of how you get those first sort of early users and how you kind of level up um, uh, to a base um, which is meaningful for you. Um, what business as usual looks like. So we're going to talk about what it's like when you actually operate in the app, um, what it looks like in terms of people and, and process. Um, the whole sort of tech updates and enhancements. So part of the way. Um, you improve and build on your app over time. It's a living, breathing organism. No such thing as an app that's just done. Um, once you start building a software product, you're intending to kind of evolve that continue over time. Um, and then we'll have a quick look at some promotion and marketing channels for you to be able to actually get people downloading your app. Um, I won't go into this because you're going to give a nice intro. Thank you. Um, all right, so sustainability. So uh, I talk about these three levels of sustainability. So uh, level one, as you're building an app is survival. How do you how do you kind of keep this app build or development going um, by basically covering your non-avoidable costs? So there's some base stuff that you're going to need when you're starting to build the app. You're going to have to pay a developer generally, unless you are a developer. Um, you're going to have you're going to create a structure which is going to have some accounting costs to it. Often you'll have a place where you're actually building this app. Um, so you'll have like a base level of costs which rain, hail or shine you have to cover. Um, so that's what we kind of call survival. Sustainability, and if you can't cover that, um, then you're definitely not setting yourself up for success. Um, then there's what's called overseas the ramen noodle profitability, but I've adapted it for Australia. Two minute noodles, are they still around? I hope they're still around. Um, <clears throat> wouldn't survive uni without two minute noodles. Um, so that's where you're covering your non avoidable expenses and you're able to pay enough just to cover like bare bones living expenses. Um, so for a lot of technology startups, this is the first milestone for them because it means we could, in theory, continue running indefinitely. Yes, we might be eating baked beans and tuna noodles. It's not a glamorous existence, but we can continue as long as need be to make this work. Um, <laughs> so it's a significant milestone. And then the third one is, hey, we're actually doing this thing and we're paying ourselves like a real market rate and this is going to be returns. Obviously, what we all aspire to in building these products is um, that is market trade. Um, I often say with apps, you don't need to be in a rush. Um, so most of you would have heard of Instagram, WhatsApp, Canva, Twitter. So what you see here is the year that they actually started turning revenue on. Um, so uh, in the case of Canva, which is a well-known Australian tech success story, they do, they do all sort of a graphic design uh, platform that makes graphic design for everybody. Um, it was only in year three after they built two million users when they started trying to make any money from it. Um, why was that? Well, they wanted to get the world's best product they want to get users engaged and effectively hooked to what they were doing before they tried to put a paywall in front of it. Um, Instagram was 100 million users before they turned it on. Their WhatsApp 250, Twitter 30 million. Um, so first and foremost, you want to build a compelling product that solves a pain point or problem for your user group. Um, and in the case of these companies, they bought themselves that time period to do it. Now, they also raised a shit ton of cash to do it, but uh, <laughs> so not everyone has that luxury. Um, uh, but ultimately, you not feeling like you need this thing to work in the next three weeks, you know, understanding that it's often a patient game to kind of grow this business. Um, all right, so some, some key points. It's kind of, I should just let the screen roll and try and look up, shouldn't I? Um, so burn rate and cash flow. So you understanding how much it's going to cost you on a monthly basis is really important. Um, uh, 
obviously you may or may not factor in your own cost into that, but knowing all the things that you're spending on a monthly basis and how much cash you have to work with, um, that often sets like a time horizon by which you have to kind of work with to either get more funding or rethink about the way you're doing um, your app. So we, we talk about this as a key number for you to know back to front. Um, spoken about the patients here, um, it's quite rare often for most um, uh, app or mobile platform plays um, to actually become profitable for year two and three. Um, and you often see payback periods of four to six years on. Um, so you're going to have to be going to this knowing you're for a longer haul um, for the economics to stack up. Um, and we also talk about sustainability in that bigger picture. So um, think about it being sustainable for you in terms of hours, stress load, etc. cetera. Um, and think about the social impact theory of change of your product. That's a whole other conversation, but sustainability isn't just a financial aspect. Um, OK, adoption and spread. Um, so most people will have seen the technology adoption curve. This has been around for, what, 50, 55 years now, um, which basically talks about a, a sort of a classic curve by which technology adoption uh, often occurs. Uh, but first off, you've got this hardcore 2.5% innovators who are the first ones who like to try new things, you know? Um, so we, we use this as a really pretty good analogy for what happens with your app. Um, your first job is to find out that first 2.5%. It may feel like a real tiny group initially, and it's not the group that you want to service longer term, but that's the group with which you can build a foundation for your whole product. Um, so I talk about levelling up your base. So um, that very first group of users you want is often like 10 or 20 people that you've like begged, you know, Leaded with um, sometimes friends and family, don't want to all be friends and family, but anyone, any and every way of you getting 10 or 20 users on your app, so you can start learning about that app, you know? So the sooner you've got something in people's hands um, where they're giving you feedback, the sooner your learning curve is going to ramp up and you're going to be able to figure out what you need to build for your product. That first 10 or 20 users is often the hardest and most important and the foundations for everything they're on. Um, then we talk about the next one there being like the super fans. It's like, okay, I've they've completed 10 and 20, now I want to go and get like maybe that next ring of people. Let's get 20, 100 people using it. Um, and by that point, you generally will want to have at least a basic working product, um, which is functioning and solving, again, a core pain point or problem that a, the user has. Then we've got what are called the super early adopters. Um, so I uh, think like the, the famous example of Facebook, they initially targeted um, 1,000 um, uh, students in Harvard. So even in Harvard, they carved it into a thousand particular ones they handpicked. And they were the first only users allowed on Facebook. Um, so talk about narrow user group to start with. Um, and then, you know, same with, with Uber, it initially targeted just black limousine drivers in San Francisco, a um, very narrow market. Um, but that's where they did their learning and figured out where they might direct that product from there. So small user groups. Hard to get initially, but this is the foundations which you can level up your user base. Uh, and then we get to that early adopter, which is more of that 2.5% we talk about, where you've got that first, what we call critical mass, but a first base um, uh, that are sort of those early adopters um, of your product. Uh, so building in viral behavior. So the virality gets used and abused as a term. Um, you know, I think you can just you know, develop a $10 referral code and it's going to go viral. Um, but it's very important you do think about this early on, and we, we think that two elements. One is um, rewards for sharing. So how do I give an incentive for every user, even early on, to tell another user about your product? Um, so the classic cases of you know, like the Uber ten dollar reward for me telling you someone else like a ten dollar ride. Um, sometimes the reward uh, is extra capability in the product. So um, if anyone was an earlier user of Dropbox, you got more storage space if you told someone else about it. There are many different ways of giving you incentive. But you want to think, even if you're a strict B2B product, it's like if someone else tells another business about my product, how do I give them some reward? You know? Sometimes it's often as simple as I send them a thank you card and a bottle of wine. But um, building that into a product level um, over time um, is really important and can help that natural sort of word of mouth um, to propagate. Um, and the second principle, an apology for an acronym here, this actually stands for network effects. Um, is how does your product become more valuable um, for every user that comes on, on board? So how does user number two make that your product more valuable for user number one? 
that is user number million and one, make it more valuable potentially for everyone down the chain. Um, and to bring this to life, think of a product like WhatsApp. You know, if there's one person on WhatsApp, not a great product. <laughs> you talk to yourself. Uh, two people, great. I can have a chat with one other person now. Um, uh, all my friends circle, great. Now all of a sudden I can actually use this sort of SMS. You know, the whole world, all of a sudden, I can pretty much reach anyone uh, via group messaging. Um, Wikipedia, another great example. Every new person that comes on Wikipedia potentially acts as a peer reviewer and an author. Um, and there's a natural sort of building that product that comes from network effects. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of thinking that says about 70% of all value that's been created in technology has actually come from people thinking about this in their product. All right, so um, business as usual. So I realize we're early, mostly early stage here, but give some quick sort of um, uh, visuals around what BAU might look like for a mobile app. Um, so the good thing about businesses, small or big, is that they're all pretty much fundamentally the same in the things they have to do. Um, the main difference in your early stage is that you have to do all of it. <laughs> um, but if we actually look at the functions and break them down, um, we share on these slides, by the way, everyone, they can have a uh, so the, the, these, same, these same functions exist in every business, large and small, and you are going to have to think about them for your app. Um, and what we often say is let's simplify it down into just real core elements. So you've got to build something, you've got to sell something, you've got to operate it, stay in the obvious. Breaking that down, well, there's got to be some component in around research. So you've got to always remain front and center. There's always some component of staying close to your customer, doing market research, interviews, collecting data that's going to help inform your product. Um, design. It's always going to be working around you know, creating um, low fidelity or high fidelity design work that can ultimately inform your engineering team. And then you're going to need an engineering team that's going to be able to execute. Um, on the sell side, there's marketing and awareness. How are you going to tell people about what you're doing? Um, how are you going to ultimately perform a sales function, particularly for if you're selling business to business? Um, and then there's an often overlooked one around retention. So a lot of people spend a lot of time getting people in the door. Um, they lose those customers and don't think about um, what's going wrong in that process so that they're actually keeping people for longer. Um, think of the operational side of it, customer service, financials, legals, accountant, and talent. Um, what I highly recommend is even early stage, you write, don't generally write more than this, but write a one pager on each of those. Um, it's probably almost certainly going to be wrong in a lot of areas. You're not trying to write a full business plan, but write a one pager. On each of those, just kind of go, here's how I think research is going to work. Here's who should be on point for it. Uh, here's our outcomes for it. Um, and so you can end up with like a seven to 10 page document, which just puts a little bit of intention and thought around all the aspects um, of your app and business. Um, in terms of teams, so um, if you look at most of the biggest tech platforms in the world, they pretty much were all built by teams of two to four initially. You know, So Jobs had his Wozniak, you know, Google. Trio, um, YouTube was built by two people, um, early days of course. Um, so what does an early team look like? Uh, you're at least going to need these roles. Sometimes you might get people playing multiple roles, but you, you, you're almost certainly going to need these roles even in the early stage. Um, app build, so on the engineering side, generally you've got someone building your actual app, the front end piece that you actually see and interacting with, and then someone building your back end, your databases, and the, the platform that your app talks to. Um, sometimes you can get a thing called a full stack engineer, which is someone who can do both. Um, they're like unicorns, you know, very hard to find, but if you find them, that's great. You can teach yourself to be that even better. Um, but you've got those two functions generally in building your app. Um, you've got this product role. I think the guys from us are going to speak a bit about some of the design components of that, but who's the one thinking about the vision for the product, um, doing the research, doing the designs, the specs, everything that's needed to uh, inform the engineering team build, um, and who's out there winning customers and thinking about the operation. Um, so even early stage, that's a complete team or a complete set of roles that you need in a business environment. Uh, okay, <laughs> um, all right, product iterations. So who, who's seen this diagram? So it's sort of a, it's one of the sort of the famous startup y diagrams, but it basically talks about um, the art of building um, products, sort of what not to do and what to do. So if you look up the top um, line, you've got the building of a car. 
Um, and uh, what do you notice about that building up a car? Any thoughts from the audience? Hey, yeah, how useful is number two, step two? How useful is step number three? So I've had to go all the way through to step four until I've actually got something which is useful. Um, if you look at uh, the how-to build, yes, I've started humbly with a skateboard. It still solved my problem of getting from point A to B, and it's useful. I can use that product very early on. Then I build a scooter, build more stability around, build a bicycle. Right? So I, at every step of the way with your product, um, you want to be building something which performs a, a, a complete function. So. Um, and I think, I think last week and today we're also going to speak a little bit more about the art of product design, but we talk about product iterations. It's like always making sure that you're putting out in front of people not half-baked things, but things that actually do something, even if it's a very small part of the overall vision you have for it. Uh, and sequencing this is really important. Um, might actually turn out in the process of building the skateboard and the scooter, you realise that people don't want to go point A and B and they actually you know, want a food truck instead. You know? Um, and you, you cut your losses at step two rather than step <laughs> four. <clears throat> um, so in terms of this sort of evolving your product, um, so time to release is a feature. So the speed with which you actually um, uh, evolve and, and build your product, that is actually a feature to you, your users. You know? um, we all know great products who just have a good cadence of releasing new and exciting stuff, and that itself is a feature of, of the app. Um, performance is a feature. We've all used things that just load slow, that that uh, are clunky. Um, people's uh, natural ADD is so <laughs> hypersensitive these days that I think, I think the stats are now that most people will give an app about five seconds, maybe 10 seconds of their time before dismissing it forever. Um, so that's the, that's the, the fickle nature that you're dealing with. Um, that first load, that first experience, um, that punchy response times, they are important and they are important even early on. Um, we talk about guilty to proven innocent. Um, so this is a bit of a methodology we do with all features of apps, is to kind of say every feature is before the court of law of your team, or maybe just you. You have to argue why every one of those features should be in there. And if you can't come up with a compelling argument that at least has some data or some compelling logic with it, it needs that before it goes in. Um, so it kind of flips that whole thinking, you know, because the thing is we all get excited about our app and our baby and we can't think of all the things it could possibly do. And we often have the big laundry list of features. Um, so really encourage you to have this mentality of like, this feature only goes in when it deserves to be. I know it should be in there. My users are telling me. Um, and it makes sure you don't waste resources on building stuff that people don't need. Um, and then there's this whole thing around balancing what you've got versus um, what's new. Um, so there's like two sort of product truths, unfortunate truths. Um, one is that probably one in four things that you try is gonna work, no matter how good you are. Um, so figure out the three that don't and discard them as quick as possible. Um, even for those one in four that do work, it's probably gonna take you, you know, three to four times longer to get it right than what you thought. So you've got these two sort of things that just, it is the nature of it. Um, and we're all optimists and think it's not gonna be, you know, we're gonna be different this time, you know, we've, uh, <clears throat> I'll be building price for 20 years this time, I'm gonna be the one who, who knows it every time. Still one in four, Things I try work, three and four don't work. Um, but if you figure out quickly what that is and if you're going to spend time on the stuff which is working, making sure it's really good, it's amazing. Um, and, and that becomes a key feature of your product. Uh, in terms of how this might look, and I didn't want to get too technical here, but um, uh, so I've done a good job of keeping this not technical, haven't I? But basically, you, you know, in an ideal world, you're looking at releasing things like every month and a half. Um, if you're releasing stuff a lot more than that, you give people a little bit of like new version fatigue. Uh, I think a lot of us have familiarity with like, I don't know, Microsoft Office updating every like two days or some new patch. Um, and if you're only updating like every half a year, it's too slow and you haven't probably responded quick enough. So you, you want to build in these sort of cadences of releasing a product, um, which can then map to like smaller deliverables that you give to your engineering team. So I won't cover dev sprints here. Um, Promotion and marketing. So um, this is sort of how you get people using your app. So here's a here's a sort of a classic sales funnel. 
diagram, um, which speaks to each of the things that need to happen for someone to commit to using your, your product. Um, there's awareness level, you know, you telling the world how to get in front of people and tell them what you do in the first place. Um, how do you educate? So um, I'm aware of it now. How do you tell me a bit more about it? Um, the education process might actually happen as part of the first part of opening your app. Um, so you often see you open an app first time and it gives you like a little tutorial or you get dynamic little tooltip type things popping up. Um, but the more you can educate a user about what it is your product is and how to use it, the less likely they are to dismiss it. Um, there's a consideration phase of like, oh, this, this looks interesting. I might This might be something I actually use. Um, this is that critical kind of, you know, I'm, I'm preferably ready to sign. Um, and then acquisition is when you've actually got someone through. They're actually a genuine user of, of your product. Um, a lot of cases with app, someone's coming in for free. Um, so about 95% of all app revenue is what we call freemium, which is I come in for free and then I upsell you to something once I've proven that this is valuable enough and worth your while. Um, so hence the lights. Um, and often the funnel does look like this, where you've got to be filling a lot of people at the top, making a lot of people aware to get all the way down to a small number of purchase. Um, so where do you go get leads from? Um, so there are hundreds and hundreds of places that will be very specific to your app as to where you get them from. And if you're doing stuff in health tech um, uh, or aged care or disability, like I've done a lot of work in, it can be very um, focused and specific where you go. but as some generalizations, um, content marketing is a good place. So you have a voice, you have a network, you have people that will listen to you. Um, if you start writing about what you do and why this is a great thing, why there's a problem or pain point that you've solved uniquely, getting content out on LinkedIn, Medium's a great channel now, um, video on YouTube works works well as well. And that's content which you can build on over time um, and starts to get just a name for what you're doing and it creates a bit of authority for you as well and around the product. Um, SEO or search engine optimization is about making sure your website and everything you talk about is consistent with your product. Um, there's plenty of techniques for you to get your page ranked high, which we won't go into. Um, and when I say viral effects here, it's again giving incentives wherever possible for people to come tell other people about what you do. Um, then we've got paid leads. So back in the day, you used to be able to like build a page on Facebook and get um, an audience for it that then would keep getting engaged with the newsfeed. Um, these days, you pretty much have to pay for all reach, you know, by and large. Um, the good news is, is that there's lots of tools for you to spend a little bits amount of money on these platforms, see if they're working, when you find something that works and amplify it up. Um, so Facebook ad, LinkedIn ads, um, they also have like install now capability as well, so you can put an ad which says, hey, try, try my, you know, uh, my wellness app, install now button, and the person can go straight from the app store from their Facebook feed. So you kind of circumvent any in-between steps, which is good. Um, YouTube ads. Um, influencers are good as well. So often in your industry will have someone who a lot of people listen to. They might have a podcast. They might have a blog. They might write regularly in, in certain uh, magazines, what have you. Um, uh, sometimes you get them for free. Sometimes you have to pay them or give them some incentive to talk about you. I don't know. Okay the last two. So just quickly showing you an example of, uh, of ads you might do for an app, um, Facebook and Instagram. So you can see here, there's a health companion app there that appears in the feed. You've got a chance to kind of sell it quickly to a user. Um, and if the person says, hey, I'm interested, you see I've also got a bit of social validation there. A million people are using this app. Um, hey, don't worry, you're not the first. Um, but you can click that install now, or click you straight to the app store, um, and then people can install straight from there. Um, so you can experiment very cheaply with this, you know, a couple of hundred dollars to start off with and you can start doing some ads and even if you get very few installs, you're going to start learning about the messaging which is connecting with your audience, what people click on uh, and what type of demographics they are. Um, landing pages. So landing pages are a good way for you to effectively sell the proposition of your app um, and again test um, propensity for people to actually install it, ideally if the app is there, but even before your app is live. You could put out the proposition of what the app is. Um, you could say go to a Facebook platform and pay for people to come to this landing page and then see how many people say, I'm interested, I'll give you my email, or even you know, go on a sort of a, a, a waiting list. Um, so if you if you do an ad on Facebook, get people interested, a lot of people click through, you show a picture of what the app could look like and what the value prop is, and no one's interested in like registering or leaving their details. 
probably not a good signal um, that your app is going to be desirable once you go live. Um, there's a tool called Instapage, which I recommend, where you can spin up lots and lots of these landing pages very simply, drag and drop. So as soon as, you, you, as, soon as you've got an image of your app and you know what the value prop of it is, um, you can spin up a page, um, pay for some traffic to get there, um, and uh, then start seeing how it resonates. Um, I wanted to give some high-level rules of thumb, which are like always wrong for an individual business, but <laughs> right in aggregate. So these days, people are paying between two to ten dollars um, for a download. Um, in busy metro markets, um, like when I was in Beijing, people are paying twenty to fifty dollars. So it can be depends on how busy your category in your city is. You're trying to get users, but that's a broad rule of thumb. Um, App retention or the number amount of people that stay on your app um, from like one month one to three is brutal. Um, so you're actually doing well if 40% of people still care about your app after month one. You're doing very, very well if more than 15% do after month three. Um, so the decay factor is, is really, really high. Think of how many apps you have on your phone versus what you actually would use consistently. Um, so if you do the numbers in that and just kind of figure out what, what it cost, the cost is per retained user or user that you've still kept, after three months, you might be spending ten to fifty dollars to actually get someone who cares about what you're doing after three months. You just got to factor that in and kind of think, how much am I making per user, and does that stack up? Am I likely to create a viable business if those economics are the rules of thumb? Um, all right, so this is the final slide. So um, I guess no one remembers more than three or four dot points from the talk, right? So um, I guess first thing is build those passionate early adopters. All good things come from that first group. Don't be ashamed if you've only got 10 or 20 people or five. All good things come from, from staying close to them and learning what you need to learn from an early adopter base. Optimise for speed. Figure any every way for you to be someone who builds things quickly, learns quickly, um, uh, <coughs> and has that as, you know, as sort of a North Star. Experiment, experiment, experiment. Keep that attitude of doesn't matter. I know, I know three and four product ideas aren't going to work. Um, I'm probably not... You know, statistically going to be more genius than anyone else on this. Let's just acknowledge that and figure out the things that do work as good as possible. Um, and additional bonus, top four tip would be actually plan for success, um, which I know sounds stupid, but like it sort of comes down to that one page of thing I spoke about is plan it out as if this is going to succeed. You know, um, uh, I, I've seen plenty of cases where people have actually got an app that really does work. Like, Shit, now I, I've, you know, then realize people would actually want to use my app, and now I've got. 10,000 people and I've got no customer support and I've got, you know, uh, I've got me working late nights and weekends just trying to keep this um, this going. So plan as if it's going to succeed. Um, if you stick it long enough, you're solving a clear pain point. Probably will. Um, here's my contact details. Um, connect with me on LinkedIn. And if you've got any sort of follow-ups from this that you want to hit me up with, there's my email. Thank you very much, Ben. Some really salient points there around sustainability. And I think it's an area that we all struggle with in healthy, with our funding cycles. And um, it can be quite a, a difficult um, kind of area for us to kind of map out when we're developing um, innovation programs and ideas, but especially with technology and apps. So we've got um, time for a couple of questions. So I'll ask if there are any questions in the room. Uh, if you do have a question, we'll bring a microphone up to you, if I can get them out of this cupboard. Were there any questions in the room? Um, hey, Jen, in terms of content update, because in health, we often, with tech, we just build one thing, release it, and then kind of see how it goes. You get feedback, you do for some minor changes, especially with video and graphics. We don't update them regularly. Do you have any guidelines for video updates or content updates? You mean stuff that's actually in your app? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I guess uh, depends on, you know, I had to do the depends question, but, but you know, it's obviously very specific to the type of business you're working on. Um, I. If it's clinical face, yeah, yeah. So uh, I've worked, for example, a lot of like learning management systems and things like that, which have videos, which you know, are still being used from like years ago. And um, but often they're good videos, um, and so you've got to kind of do that sort of you know turn on investment analysis to kind of go, yeah, I could record these. 
Um, but what do my current users think of it right now? So generally your signal is, is again, keeping close to the people using it. And if they kind of go, hey, this is still extremely valuable, it still solves the pain point, um, then, you know, while some of the content might look long in the tooth, think about investing money in that versus other things. Um, it might still be worth keeping that content. Um, the other thing I will say is that a lot of content creation costs have plummeted too, if you're really smart about it. So there's lots of agencies that will do, say, video work for more like $500 to 1000 It used to cost 10000 to 20000 <laughs> Well, my sister runs an agency who does it for food. But, um, uh, but so generally talking freelancers, um, uh, and uh, I do have a network of people, so if you, if, you, if that's something you're interested in, I'd have to share it. But Yeah. 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 I was coming in that case. I said it was. Uh, did I say five hundred thousand? I said that uh, five hundred to two thousand two million. No. Um, uh, yeah. So if you, look, if you have to hire talent, if you have to bring like clinical equipment and book space, obviously there's no there's like no getting around that sort of cost. But um, yeah, I've. I've done like an LMS thing last 12 months. We did the whole suite of like 20 videos for uh, under 15 grand. So, so you know, um, the cost the cost has plummeted, um, but you've got to kind of know where to find those, you know, other freelancers or people without overheads that can do that that price. Yeah. Are there any other questions from the room or anything about the Hi Ben, thanks very much for the presentation really practical tips which I think everyone will agree is quite useful. Um, we do have a question from one of our streamers, which is, when should you start planning for sustainability for your app? Uh, well, from day one, to be honest, <laughs> but not too much. Um, so it's kind of, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of use of like one pages in startup world, and, and the point of that is spend just enough time to think it through on one page, but no more. Um, so if you're writing 60 page documents up front, that's not the best use of time, but not writing anything is also not smart either. Um, so there's lots of tools where you spend one page just designing at the high level, knowing that it's probably wrong on day one, but it's your best guess given the data you know. Um, and then you set a cadence of kind of revisiting that, you know, sometimes monthly or, you know, uh, as, as appropriate. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, by you kind of knowing what you don't know and knowing what to test for up front, it also kind of helps you with those experiments you're running. So um, I'm generally not one to, to like people going in completely blind, but also not writing big documents. Um, so there's a lot of tools now to, 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 to sort of find a, a middle ground in between. All right, well, I think um, we'll move on to our next session. Um, we'll take one in and we'll take one in and we'll take So I'd like to invite our next speaker um, up. Abraham Robertson comes to us from the Department of Finance Services and Innovation and works uh, with the policy and innovation team there. Um, Abe's worked closely with us, I think, in, in the time of the network as a great support and is well networked and well resourced. So we've invited him along today to talk to us about partnering and fundraising. So I'll hand over the baton to him. Welcome. Thanks very much for having me. I think it's such a great initiative from Dan Gianni, really everyone in health to do this. And so I think from other people in New South Wales to know that you're out there trialling apps, there's a lot of support available for you. I'm going to talk to you about two really weird things from a government employee, which is fundraising and partnering. Um, but I'll, first, I kind of have to do my obligatory, like go through what we do and, and, and where we sit within um, New South Wales government. Uh, basically, we're a pretty small team. We sit in the Sydney Startup Hub. Uh, we primarily are focused on large social issues and how we can use competition, um, challenges and innovation to try and approach them differently. So we run incubation and acceleration type programs. I've worked with a lot of the people you, you hear speak today. The other types of programs we run is we're looking at the CX pipeline. And I do want to mention this one just because I think it might be of interest to some of you. If you're building an application that does impact citizens in New South Wales, there's a lot of um, services available within government. So there's uh, the transformation unit that sits within DFSI. So they'll build something for you. There's Digital New South Wales Accelerator, the DNA. Um, they'll help you do your 
customer journey and user mapping. So if you throw your idea into them and maybe we can work out how we can facilitate that coordination, um, they might be able to help you with that early stage prototyping and researching of your citizens' needs. Um, and there are also common components. So there's, they're about to release a design system which will standardise how you build an application or any sort of digital interface that goes to New South Wales citizens. You're not meant to know about this. This hasn't been released yet. But this is what's been worked on in the background. So there's a lot of effort that's going on that's yet to come. And so if you're looking into an application, keep your, your eye out for this because uh, they're resources that you can all tap into. Um, the other sorts of programs we run, uh, we recognise that sometimes there are innovative new services out there uh, in the private sector and government's interested in that. And so what we do is try and educate ministers uh, and the agency about what that innovation is. So we're looking at blockchain, AI, machine learning, um, all sorts of initiatives like that. And then we try and take them through a pipeline of how can we get prototypes, testing and trialling happening. So at the moment we're working with 12 different AI startups that are going to be working with about 15 different agency groups. Um, so if there's something that you want in a, in a in, if you see on the left-hand side, drones, medtech, quantum computing, if there's something that lines up with what you're doing, again, we might be a good touch point to have a chat with us about that and who we can introduce you to. Uh, the, the primary reason they brought me in um, was to look at the acceleration program. So we've done three um, innovation challenges. We looked at reducing domestic violence reoffending. We looked at youth unemployment, and Ben was probably our best mentor through that program. Uh, and we looked at making the city more accessible for people with disabilities. So the way we do that is we take that one big issue, then we take it to market effectively and say who's got an idea, who's got something out in the market, come and talk to us. We'll give you pretty significant upfront funding, up to 150000 which is no, it's no equity, it's just a, a grant effectively. And then not only that, but we'll work with you for up to 16 weeks and really try and test that idea, drive it into the market, see if it's got any sort of traction on the back end of it, we'll act as a sort of gateway to government and help you through that procurement process to sort of facilitate that because it can be very difficult. Um, work, I'm sure some of you all know that being from New South Wales government, how difficult it can be to work through procurement in New South Wales, especially for innovative solutions. Um, but we've been relatively successful, I think. We've done, had 24 teams go through. We've given about $2.3 in that upfront funding. We've got $8.3 in ongoing contracts at the moment. Um, so that's been, especially in the youth unemployment, that's been... A, really good success success rate. So I thought I'd give you a couple of case studies. So Swift there, uh, where a couple of boys are actually out of Atlassian, um, they came to us and said one of the problems they've identified in the market is um, the transport taxi subsidy scheme. Some of you, I think you, this cohort will probably know this more than any others, but um, you basically get a checkbook and you sign up to it and pay 50% of the fee that goes to the taxi driver, the taxi driver takes that back. There's all sorts of issues with that. There's audit problems, reporting problems, there's um, fraud problems, but really for the user, it's a terrible experience. And firsthand, my mum has MS, and so she's part of the trans trax trans taxi transport sex subsidy scheme, um, but she can't use her hands. And so for her, that experience of trying to get a checkbook out and sign it, either we have to sign it beforehand, or she basically gets the taxi driver to do that for her. So what the boys did was actually just digitise the whole process from booking the app, booking the taxi, to paying the person, to getting the feedback. And government loves it because really it's the fraud it breaks down. Um, if you lose, lose one of those checkbooks, we don't really know where it ends up. It's quite difficult to track. They're doing a great job and hopefully we'll see a rollout of that pretty soon. Uh, this is one of my favourites. It's called Hacktivate. And if you have a few moments where you're sitting there and you get a bit sick of listening to me, I go to hacktivate.io. Uh, and you'll see how intense that is as a landing page that Ben talked about before. Um, this was built by Todd Southern up in Byron. It was part of our youth um, unemployment challenge. What he noticed was that he was a disengaged young person that was digitally savvy and literate, but not engaged within the education system. So he taught himself how to code at a very young age and was out there sort of gaming and hacking into things. And he thought, why don't I try and build a solution? And it is basically an app-based solution to gamify um, the learning of digital skills for these young people. And when you go on, you'll see how much he's thought about the user experience and making sure that what he's building is appropriate for that end user. It's really quite intense and quite a bit of fun. Okay. <laughs> so what I can talk about was uh, uh, bootstrapping grant and funding. So before I worked at New South Wales government and what I'm involved in a lot on the science is that startup space. Worked in New York for a number of years. I've worked in South Africa, in the UK, 
And back here in about 2010, we set up our first company before there was a venture capital market. And so when we went to raise money for our company, which was doing quite well, there was only two funds that we could go to. A gentleman called Gareth Dando at Southern Cross Venture Partners, who's still there and is quite interested in health tech, if you're looking for someone who's uh, investing in this space. And then there was a, a corporate venture out of Macquarie. So it didn't quite work out for us when we were looking. So we raised money from Nippon Gas in Japan and Bill Moss from Macquarie Bank. Both of those just stitched us up, to be honest. Like, they were way more sophisticated than we were. They were very good at the terms. The shareholder agreement put us down, but we were in a very good position to raise money, but we couldn't. So a lot of us went overseas and did different things. I worked in different commodities markets, built other applications and the like. Um, but when I came back here, we set up a couple of small companies. Most of, two of them have raised their seed round now. We've got another one we're just about to do a bit of a fundraise for at the moment. So I guess I'm talking to a bit from my own personal experience of, um, of, of going through the process of building out a company from those very early stages. I didn't realise it was so focused on applications. So I'm just going to talk generally about startups, really. Um, and two things I want to talk about are where you can get free money, which is the best type of money, uh, and where you can get someone else's money, which, again, I think is better than using your own money. Um, so firstly, there's, I think you might have heard of family, fools and friends. Uh, my advice on this is if you want to go to a Christmas and have people talk to you, don't take money from family. If you will like your friends, don't take money from friends. And if they're fools, then they're probably not a good litmus test for what you're trying to build. So my view, personally, humbly, is don't go to family, friends and fools, but that is definitely one route. And I think also in that is you can personally fund your own startup for sure. That's the bootstrapping approach. Um, I think there's a real litmus test when you get to capital raising. It's a great way to test is something that I'm building somewhat feasible when someone else says, here's my hard earned money and I can invest in it. The reason I say, uh, I tend to say go after money early and fast, because why not? Australia has one of the largest pools superannuation in the world there is a ton of money out there there's a ton of very wealthy slightly older people in australia and they want to have a bit of fun with 20 50 100 grand um in our experience has been it's not that hard to find good investors what is hard is to show that you are investable that's the that's the match make that's the problem here and and to do that it's all about traction it's all about the people it's all about the team it's all about the market and what you're trying to build so if you've got something that's investable i suggest go talk to investors as soon as you can it doesn't mean they're going to say yes from that day, but if you start taking them on that journey, it makes it much easier later on when you've proven yourself up a bit further um, to get that money from them. But a few other things. I haven't, do have the R&D tax incentive. I think Australia is actually a very great, it's a great place to start a business. There's, the R&D tax incentive is an amazing scheme. Are you, is any, are you guys familiar with the R&D tax incentive? Um, so basically, if you spend a dollar on research and development, uh, you can get about 40 cents back, roughly, um, from the government. So that's just a rebate. It's just you when you file um, your tax return at the end of the year, you put in an application and they feed that money back into you. That's just trying to incent the government, trying to incentivize. Nowhere else in the world, I think, does something like that. Um, there's the um, early stage innovation. Oh, I just realized it was in front of me. There's, there's, there's also ESIC at a federal level. Have you guys heard of ESIC or Early Stage Innovation Company? So this was uh, set up probably about two years ago. Um, it's a very, um, it's, a, it's a tax incentive for early stage investors. So if you invest in an early stage company and there's, there's a test for what is an early stage company and you're the investor, you get a 20% tax offset immediately. So if I invest $100,000, I get $20,000 tax offset, which I can push against other income streams I've got, but you also pay no CGT or no capital gains tax for the first 10 years, which is, I mean, that is a, that's a, a very good incentive if you're taking um, pretty high risk but early, early stage investing. Did what I say make sense to most people? I'm just trying to work out if I'm pitching that, that's right, so the ESIC you guys get. And then there are some other schemes out there, and I'm going to put up a, um, a roadmap of where you can get free money in, in Australia at the very end, and I'll leave it up there. You can take a photo or I can send you all the links so you can have a look. But that's basically it's a, a roadmap of grants in New South Wales and across the, across the federal Australia. Um, I, I probably shouldn't say this from New South Wales, but Queensland has some amazing incentive schemes. If you raise a decent amount of money, uh, the business development fund in Queensland is very, very attractive. Uh, that's match funding up to 2.5 million. I don't know anywhere. Uh, maybe South Korea have something as, as attractive as that. So if you get to those later stages, Queensland is a good place to live. 
Um, I do want to mention too, New South Wales funding though is, is the MVP grant. Has anyone heard about that? Is this good? Okay. Uh, we should probably get better at marketing these to the people like yourselves. Um, but that's match funding of up to $25,000. It is a competitive grants process, um, but it's worth, you may as well throw in an application in, in my view. It's a good application just to think about, you know, what is it, what am I building? Is this, is it going to get somewhere? Am I asking the right questions? So it's only about two, three pages. Um, and then there's the building partnerships grant. This one is a little bit more complicated and it's probably when you're a bit further down, but the idea of the building partnerships grant is you partner with two other organisations uh, and, and they act as sort of lead generators for your application or business or whatever it is, and that's up to 100000 Uh Maybe taking a little bit of a step back, I thought I'd just take you through how generally how people might look at, at, at building out those early stages of company. And I think this is early, up to a million to five mil, that's early funding. That's really, you're about to scale. You're probably not sure if you're going to make any money out of this or not. But that's you know, but, but for most people, I think that's a decent amount of funding. That's two, three year roadmap of development. But an idea is pretty easy, and the next step is that product risk. So can this team actually build something? The next step is will someone actually buy it? So that's the market risk, and then you get really get into a more difficult phase, which is can you actually make money from that? So that's the product risk, the market risk, and the financial risk. Um, and these are probably, generally speaking, about they're probably a bit low now, I would say. I would say seed round now is probably one mil to three mil. It's probably more common. Uh, and then three mil plus would be into your Series A. Other people might have different views on that. Uh, I think it's pretty easy to have questions at the end, and I'm happy to... I right, do apologise. Uh, I did want to just run through... There, there is... An, I saw someone from Cicada might be pitching later, which is pretty amazing. Cicada is... is internationally considered one of the best um, incubation acceleration programs in the world so to hear from them later would be pretty amazing um, i do want to definitely compliment ben and peter from remarkables i think that's a world-class um, accelerator program and i would imagine most of you might fit within their remit so if you build a company and you're looking for support a, a program of support um, remarkables would be a great opportunity i would say come look at us because we have the most money uh, <laughs> Really, I mean, we just, we just write bigger checks, but we, we're we very, very focused on specific issues. Um, and generally, we're looking more for social enterprises, happy for it to be for-profit, but we're very focused that more general opportunities are in the incubator, or maybe I should have asked that question. Do people know what an incubator or accelerator is? Accelerator program? A couple of you? So basically, uh, my mother one has to explain this, but... Um, Basically, it started in Silicon Valley, uh, effectively. Uh, y Combinator was probably one of the first, and if you want to look at look into this, Y Combinator is a very good place to start. Um, basically, it's a program of how can we rapidly go from idea through that product market into that monetization risk. So if you're an investor going, well, I've got a portfolio of 10 companies, how can I ramp them up or accelerate them? Let's put them through a, a, a coordinated program of support. And so they'll take you through setting up your business, the marketing, um, product and pricing. I mean, I learned about Goldilocks pricing from Ben when he was presenting at one of ours, which is basically put three prices and you want the middle one. So you're sort of uh, conditioning the buyer to focus on the middle price. I thought it was great. Um, and this is, but this is how we run our, our incubator accelerator program. So we open applications. We have a lot of feedback with, your, with you as the applicant. We close that, we go into a sort of an assessment period where you br we bring you all together. What we're really testing there is you. We don't really care about your idea at this point. We're trying to work out, will that found to be someone we can work with for the next 16 weeks? Do we think they've got what it takes to push this through? Uh, we then do a broad pitch event. So can you sell your idea? Uh, and we do a, um, a panel of judges that then tell us who we're going to take. So we step away from selecting who the winners are going to be and we let some industry experts tell us. Um, we announce it with the minister and then we'd spend that 14 weeks is this incubation uh, incubate idea period where we take you through all of that and we give you mentors and guidance we open doors for you make introductions we try and tell you about pitfalls and lessons that we've learned along the way to sort of ramp you up a bit um, and then we put you into pilots and I think that I'm going to talk a little bit about partnerships but that pilot with an agency or pilot within health within 
your LHD is amazing and such a great um, sim signal uh, to investors that someone's interested in your product. Uh, and then we talk about launching. Um, okay, so maybe I was just throwing ideas down at this point, but but I think where I normally do, I'm normally involved in the strategy for our company. So how are we setting up the governance structures? How are we setting up the company? Where is our capital? What is our capital raising pathway? Uh, who are our customers? Who are our investors? And how are we telling a story along the way? And then I put a lot of pressure on everyone else to show me traction. So I go to my tech team and I say, show me what you're doing. I go to our, our sales and marketing team. I say, tell, tell me how many sales you've made and talk to the CEO about, well, what, what other metrics can we talk about? But really, it's about product customers and, and partnerships. I think they're the three best met metrics other than pure sales and volumes and users. So the product is like, how, how far along are you? So at the moment, Ben talked about every one and a half month, you might want to do a new um, drop effectively or, or, or go, you've made a finish a sprint and launch a new version of the product. I can tell you that with one of our companies, we're about three months into the last drop of a, a new product and we're all pulling our hair out because we haven't been able to tell the story to our investors about where have we been, what are we doing, why is it taking it so long. In terms of customers, uh, it's just about growth. You just want to show that you're continuing to build and build and build. So I'm I, again, I'm talking from the idea of capital raising where you can um, do that side of it. Uh, while we haven't dropped it, our product has been very slow, our customer base just keeps ramping up, which is causing us a problem on the product, which is a nice story to tell. And then partnerships is is really, really important. So LHD supporting you, being part of the innovation network, I think is really important. That's a great signal. It says you've got mentorship and, and sort of support networks around you. Um, I think partners are really important when you're doing procurement with New South Wales. I'll say that in, the, in this context because a lot of you might be building applications where government will be a purchaser. Whenever you go through procurement, one of the first things they ask you is, well, who, who are you partnering with or who can you get a referral from, reference from? So you might want to think about that early if you're building something that you want to end up selling to government. Uh, and then those any other metrics is I was just like, well, anything else you can fill a page, uh, fill a page with, building out your team, um, protecting IP. If you're in a regulatory environment that you've got licenses and you're ticking along the boxes along that way, these are all good signals to sell to investors when you're telling that story. Just thought I'd put that in there for you. I think we've kind of gone through most of that already. Um, but this is the roadmap which might be of interest to you and I'll leave it up there so you can have a look. Um, a couple that I would just point out to you is the um, accelerating commercialization, which is down, this one down here. Um, accelerating commercialization is up to a million dollars in funding from the federal government. And it's been an amazing, um, I think Atlassian actually received that. Um, pretty sure Canva's received that. Uh, um, it, it's up I mean, a million dollars up front and you get all these support. Um, it, it's, a, it's a great, great one to go for. Uh, and a few others, if you are looking at international um, expansion, Australia does do a great job in providing support to you if you expand. I know this might be a bit far afield, but just so you know, so New South Wales Trade and Investment is there and they will open doors for you internationally. And Austrade is really, really excellent at um, doing missions, uh, making introductions. At the moment, we're using them in Singapore, Malaysia and in um, uh, Tel Aviv. And in every one of them, they're incredible. You, you basically get an agent that acts as your sales and marketing person on the ground. They know the people who talk to. Uh, they'll make the introduction so that when you walk in, there's this friendly face that says, we know you already. It's, it's a great way to spread your wings as you go overseas. Um, and they're very open to helping you out. And if you do do that, then there's the export market development grant. And so 50% of everything you spend on those export market development activities, um, the government will rebate back to you as well. So again, I think it's a great place to start a business. I encourage you to do that. There's lots of support out, out there for you, um, lots of ways to access money, lots of reasons why investors will invest in you. You just kind of have to show them a bit of traction. Uh, and if Ben is a person to go to for a question on something specific, I'm probably the question person to go to about someone you want to meet. I'm happy to make the introduction. Ben's probably got a lot more expertise on how to do it. Um, yeah, happy to help out where we can. and. As I said before, there are a lot of services within government that might be able to help you, especially if you are engaging with, with the citizen effectively, 
especially within the health network. And so hopefully as this network grows, we'll be able to tap into you and, and provide some of those services to you. That's all I've got. Thanks so much, Abe. You're always so inspiring and makes us feel like there is money, which is nice. Um, is there any questions from the audience? I think there was some from online. We do have one question. Thank you again. I agree with you, um, Gianni. Um, how do health staff access the startup hub? Uh, just walk in. I'm not <laughs> kidding. Dead set. Every night there's free beers somewhere in that place, and no one knows who anyone is. I like to call it. I uh, hope this isn't being recorded because that, that's not going to go down well. But I like to think of it as a new library. This is a place where everyone can learn and educate. It was paid for by the New South Wales citizens, which is you as taxpayers. Go in there and use it, and they want you there. Everyone wants to see health tech startups. We think that's something that New South Wales and Australia can do really well. Everyone will want to meet you. So say hello to all the different floors, introduce yourself, tell them what you're doing, tell them what you're trying to achieve, and they will invite you in for drinks. Um, there's so many support, there's such a great supporting sort of atmosphere there. Uh, there's fish burners. I mean, if people don't know, there's fish burners on the first floor. If you're really, really early stage, Tank Stream Labs, if you're a little bit more developed and sort of know where you're going. Stone and Chalk, if you're looking at FinTech and InsureTech, but they're expanding out as well. If you're in the arts community or media, um, there's the studio up above. I'm there as well, so I'm happy to introduce you to anyone there. Uh, but there are meetups every night. There's um, workshops. There's all sorts of events. And, and really go in and say hello. That would be the best way. Is just walk in and say hello. Uh, or... Um, all, all the universe, like yes, a general comment on universities is is that all the universities have noticed that their students need an entrepreneurial experience, and so all of them have really great programs. One of the best is I Accelerate, University of Wollongong, but there's UTS Hatchery, which is now UTS Startups, which is run by Murray Herps. Um, Elizabeth Eastman runs Universe, University of New South Wales. Don Wright out at Western Sydney University. Um, there's Tanya Egerton, who's up in Southern Cross University. If you're near a university, I would strongly encourage you to find that hub. Uh, it's a great access to research, to designers, to tech, to free labor. No, not free labor, but you know, there's students who can help you out. Um, yeah, so I would tap into those university networks as well. They're, they're, I think now in the next couple of years, you'll really see them shine. Some great startups come out of there. I've actually got two questions. Um, firstly, where is this place that you're talking about? The, uh, the Sydney Startup Hub. It's, uh, level, uh, it's 11 to 31 York Street, just above Wynyard Station. So it was 11 floors. Um, Jobs for New South Wales um, took over all the 11 floors with the idea of putting four or five different co-working spaces in there and providing a sort of hub where lots of entrepreneurial startup activity can happen. And it's become a bit of a central place to sort of, uh, especially early stage startups, to grow and thrive. So is that specific to New South Wales <coughs> staff? Or? No, that's, that's New South Wales broadly, generally. That's just the private sector, but everyone's welcome there. Um, if you are doing a health, I'd strongly suggest looking at Cicada. I think, I think it's probably the best for med tech and health, so I'll go out and have a look at that as well. And that's just across the way, if you haven't been there before at ATP, the Australian Technology Park. Um, the, the second thing that you mentioned in one of your slides, uh, which, I'm sorry, it just sounds too good to be true, uh, it's just <laughs> that in the, um, that, uh, the tax incentives uh, for R&D, um, you know, I mean, maybe I'm just really cynical, but how do you prove that what you're doing is R&D? So, yeah, so there's a number of ways you can do it. I, I would strongly encourage PwC, Ernst & Young and Deloitte not to pay their fees, but I would just give them a call and say, hey, this is what I'm looking for. Have you got any information you can send me on it? And they have these amazing packs that detail exactly how it works, and it's quite accessible. Um, they might be online as well. Um, there are also R&D tax incentive advisors and specialists, and there's a list of them on the website that I'm, I'm pretty sure, I can't remember, I think it's Austrade where you can find it, but if you just do R&D tax incentive, generally speaking, you're either in or you're out. So it's pretty, I think it's relatively easy to work it out whether you apply or not. Like if you're, if you're just providing a service offering into health, that's not R&D, you know that. But if you are building an application 
that might improve the citizen experience for, I don't know, engaging with emergency rooms, ICU unit or something, I, I don't know, then that's more likely to be a, a process of testing and trialling and iterating. Make sure you keep all the records of your expenditure, your hypothesis, why you're building something. Why ben mentioned it before about that, that document keeping, about why you're doing something. That's really important. Before you set about going, if you want to, if you're going for R and D tax incentive, my view, my personal suggestion is June the year before you start thinking about how you're going to build out your company, and then you spend the year keeping all the records and all the expenditure and all the reasoning behind that. But there's a lot of information out there that you can access, and the accounting firms in particular have done a great job in sort of putting that all into one place. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, Okay, now we have our next speakers, um, Joel and Simon from Us Too. Um, so I'm just going to introduce them, and they also have a Mac presentation. So we all know how that goes. So we're going to get some AV support to come and help. Um, so Joel Bryden is the managing director at Us Too Sydney, with clients including Qantas, ABC, Google, Westpac, Network 10, Cancer Council, and Caltex. Joel has worked across Sydney and London, creating products focused on design thinking develop and development that makes a meaningful impact on the world. Um, Simon is a lead visual product designer at Us2. Um, Simon joined the Australian contingency in January this year, having spent the majority of his professional career at us 2 be in Sweden. His clients include Google, Sony, Hasbro, Emirates, Thales and Naver. Simon joined us too in 2013 after his time at Sony in Sweden, and he brings a broad range of tools and skills to the table, such as user experience and user interaction design, motion design, illustration, prototyping, 3D art, product strategy, team leadership, Unity experience, and VR games experience. So thank you. Thank you very much for having us here today. Uh, thank you for the very warm introduction as well. I'm Joel, I'm the Managing Director of Us2 Sydney. I'm Simon, Lead Visual Designer. <laughs> and we do have Max because we're designers and we make things <laughs> complicated and I'm sorry about that. I'm going to give a quick Us2 overview, just a bit about us and some of the work that we've been doing to sort of set Simon up to go into a bit deeper. He's going to talk a bit about how we think about design and bringing product to market. When we talk about product, we're meaning websites, apps, immersive technology, whatever it might be. So this is what we're all about. Um, just to hone in on the, the, the meaningful visual experiences, uh, it is about the user, it is about trying to shift the needle in their everyday lives. It can come in all ways, shapes and forms. Some great examples that we've just talked to about today and where we can use digital to apply that and just make everyday lives better. That's, that's a win for us. That's what we get motivated by. We're four studios across the globe. There's about 300 of us. We're the youngest of the, of the four uh, studios here in Sydney. And we play in a couple of areas. We do the innovative client work of some of the, uh, the clients and partners that we're very proud to, to work with here in Sydney. Uh, we also do our own games. And one game in particular, Monument Valley, has had 20 million downloads and it's uh, won an Apple Design Awards, like the Oscars of uh, games, uh, and done incredibly well and sort of like a testimony of what, what's achievable in, in the mobile uh, space. And we're also uh, in, involved in ventures. Um, we're putting some capital into some interesting businesses that we uh, have interesting ideas or interesting people and we actually learn from that as well and we bring a lot of those uh, into conversations that we have with our partners. just want to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've done. Um, Moon Notes is a digital journaling app uh, and we approached some psychologists in uh, LA who had an existing app. Um, because it was designed and made by psychologists, you could probably tell about the aesthetics and the, uh, it, it needed a little bit of work. So we approached them and said, look, why don't we partner up and we take that fantastic content and then we spin out a new app and that, that is then Moon Notes. And it's been really awesome. I, I, I sort of use Moon Notes. Very simple, loaded up, uh, smiley face, tracks your mood and, at any current given point and it starts to build patterns and then there's some content that comes back that sort of gives you some uh, insight to what those patterns are. Uh, we partnered with Older Hay uh, in Liverpool in the UK, uh, and this was an app to help uh, kids in hospitals sort of deal with some of that anxiety of, of, of a hospital visit. And it's really just um, a distraction, really, uh, to, to sort of put it simply, where it's an augmented reality type solution. Kids go in, it sort of tells them a bit about what the experience is going to be. 
it also educates some of the parents at the same time. Just um, There's a lot of common questions about hospital visit, visits and just trying to use a digital means to service some of those as opposed to constantly going to, to sort of the, the frontline staff there. Uh, just the last one I'll talk to is Wayfinder. So we got some beacons, some Bluetooth beacons. They're these uh, devices that emit a, a low radiation, no, no radiation, low, low emission type, type uh, uh, signal. And as you sort of pass them, it, it can trigger an event on your mobile phone. Uh, what we realised, there was a really interesting use case with these in terms of helping vision impaired people navigate more independently. And just through experimentation, we started uh, working with the Royal London Society of the Blind. Uh, we realised we could set those beacons up and actually uh, um, blind people could more readily just, just navigate themselves. Now, this has gone out. This is actually split out from us too in terms of its own organisation. I uh, got a, a million dollars from Google.org to, uh, to, to do that, and it's become the open-based standard uh, in, uh, in sound-based wayfinding. So really, really stoked on that one. Just to talk uh, some of the, I suppose, the philosophies we think about when we build apps or websites or whatever it might be, and some of those Ben actually touched on, so that's good to hear. We're not, we're, we're, talk, we're all talking the same language, um, but it is around delivering value early and often. It's, it's thinking about what is that minimum set of features or the minimum viable product, and getting that out there. You're not going to realise any benefits from something that's still uh, just in development. So it's about thinking about what those, those that minimum set is, getting it out there, learning from that, uh, and then iterating over time um, fr from, from the app or, or website or what it might be. Just working as one team, it's like a philosophy that we use when we, we work with partners. Like the product doesn't know certain people involved. It, it's really about coming together and having, creating strong dynamics as a, as a, as a group. Uh, when we work with partners, we're bringing digital expertise to the table, but we, we rely on the subject matter expertise that comes from them, and that, that bridges a a really good union. Uh, and lastly, just being uh, curious and, and always have that learning mindset. Like, it is fine not to know the answers as you set out upon this, but you use the process to start to uncover it uh, and have, have faith in the process and the experimentation and to start to realise some of those answers in time as, as you start to go. And that's, that's totally fine. And to keep that curiosity up and not to sort of rest on laurels thinking that you know all the right answers because uh, it changes so rapidly. It's always important to keep that up um, as we go throughout. I'll hand over to Simon. Hey, thanks, Gianni. Thanks, Joel. Um, I just wanted to talk a bit about um, digital product design, which is what we do at us too. Um, it's a bit of a black box for some. Some of these pieces, um, Abe and Ben have already touched upon as well. So, um, but I just wanted to break it down a little bit, a bit of an overview of what it takes to actually make something. Uh, and I've broken it down into eleven, what I call eleven steps for designing great digital products. Um, so number one is start with a mission. Um, you're going to try and create that value proposition. You need to be really clear about what that is because um, it needs to be something that's going to create value for the users or patients in the medical um, uh, case, and it needs to be something that's going to create value for the business or whatever cause you're out to um, uh, or problem you're out to solve. Um, and ideally, it's a differentiator, so bringing something to the market that's new, that's innovative, and uh, isn't just the same as everything else. Um, and it's so important, we believe, because it's going to be that North Star. It's going to be that thing that the product is trying to achieve um, and something that's going to navigate all decisions and efforts throughout, throughout the journey. Um, so with each uh, step, I'm just going to bring up an example as well. If you take Wayfinder, one of our own products, which is now you know, its own company and its own standard, um, their mission is clearly stated on, on, the, uh, on the landing page. Um, it's amazing how many companies or products get this part wrong. You land on the landing page and you're not entirely sure what, what this thing is supposed to be doing. Um, and we believe it's so important because the mission will uh, inform every service product, uh, service product, brand and design decision throughout the project life cycle. So craft it carefully. Um, align using values, uh, we believe is very important. And it has to be right because it's going to be what the service and the product believe in. It's going to be true to the business and the cause its customers and its people, so those are um, certain things you need to understand quite well. Um, and these values are not just um, fluffy things that we people talk about and the team tries to focus on. They're, they're guiding principles. They're going to inform how the brand looks and behaves, how we talk about the product, how we market the product, um, and also the most important features, for example, that need to go into it. Um, and shared ownership is super important about like creating those values because it's going to be the team that then 
talks about them. So it's really important to um, uh, facilitate that autonomy at scale. Um, back to Wayfinder again, they created the open standard and um, their uh, values are very clearly stated uh, on, that, on that landing page. So because it is an open standard, everyone can work with it. They want it to scale. So the values that there are front and center on, um, on that standard is just a testament to how they help align teams and create direction for um, autonomy and scale. Uh, number three, team culture matters. Um, culture is different in every organization, obviously, but making it a culture that everyone can feel something that they belong to and can influence is extremely important. Um, so identifying the best ways of working for exactly those people um, and being collaborative in how you create those. Um, making sure you've got the right team makeup and accountability is assigned, and that is something that we like to um, like exposed through conversation, less not at all in like a hierarchical way. Um, and aligning on expectations, okay, so we know that I can count on this person for this and count on that person for that. Um, calling out all the, the expectations and jobs that you think need to be done so that nothing falls between the chairs. Um, and of course, transparency is super important because you want everyone to become an expert at the end of the day. Of course, um, everyone's like, Unique knowledge and learnings are, are precious. You know, knowledge is power, if you want to use that one. But it's not like anyone is going to um, use that against uh, people or exploit everyone. So sometimes that culture is really hard to, to break down in different organizations. So we, we use exercises to try and get, remove that hierarchy um, and make sure that the, the information is available. Um, so we do, like I said, we do use a lot of uh, team alignment exercises. And this is something that we'll have to be revisited often with clients, um, but uh, we want to make sure who we know who our stake, uh, like the core team is, and whoever the um, peripheral team is for support, and then everyone gets to weigh in on what they expect from each part of the, of the team, um, because we believe at the end of the day that sharing and setting expectations and aligning on individual accountability uh, ensures better collaboration. Uh, number four, um, creating an opportunities backlog is always something to maintain. So there's a lot of product ideas that are floating around. Most projects start with a single idea. Um, and then a lot of other people weigh in and the, the, those ideas change over time. Um, so it's always worth assessing those and how important they are and which ones you should focus on. So one way is like what makes your product, uh, product unique. Uh, like I said before, bringing differentiator into the market. Um, and another lens could be looking at every idea and thinking which is core, which is the product, which ideas um, we absolutely have to have in this for it, in order for it to work, which uh, you could say signature or branded, so which ones are those differentiators? Um, and then there's also nice to have. So looking at the older Play product backlog, this is probably only one iteration of it. Um, it's so important to get all the ideas up on the board. You can have a physical board, you can have a digital board. There's tons of different tools. It depends on how your team is distributed. Um, but get anything visible like that, um, just like encourages that culture of transparency. It, it like creates um, opportunities for people to see where ideas are overlapping, um, and it inspires creativity. Uh, number five, product character and style is extremely important. Um, it's it's the branding part. It's probably the, the area that a lot of people are very familiar with. Um, so how does this product look and feel? It needs to resonate back to those values and back to that mission. Because you're speaking to the users in their own language. So what's the tone of voice? using how we're talking about the product, how we're talking about the value. Um, there's, there's different ways to do it. Um, at us too, we like to take a very lean approach to it. Um, and uh, this is one example called the Brand Sprint. And it's six pretty simple exercises you can do with all the stakeholders involved. Um, it doesn't take an extremely creative person. It's all about getting the feedback and input from, from everyone involved. Um, and the, the designers will be able to um, pick and choose these depending on exactly what type of information they think is missing. Um, and you can just see here in older play, for example, the way that the style has progressed over time. Uh, initially, it's about getting an idea across, um, and then that will evolve in higher and higher fidelity. You can see the copies change from Meet the Critters to Pick Your Buddy, for example. Um, that's not just random copy that someone thought was better. It's obviously um, through user research they realized that that type of language would resonate better um, with the kids out there. Um, and then into the fully-fledged uh, uh, AR experience. Um, and I think just a, a side note is this to allow time for exploration. 
uh, like a brand and the fidelity is not created overnight. It's there's not like a, a light bulb moment for designers. I mean, their 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 job is creativity, but it's it's all about practice and experience and just trying out different ideas and seeing how they land. In the same way you would features for a product. Um, so the brand will evolve and grow with each new iteration, and also with the uh, um, product learnings. Uh, number six is identify what we don't know. Um, extremely important. We need to find the facts. Everyone in the room is going to weigh in what they think is you know, common knowledge or is absolute truth. And through um, just discussion, you can identify which are facts and which are mere assumptions. Um, and then you can check your blind spots as well. There might be through that conversation you realize that um, there's something we haven't actually considered at all. It's not even that we don't see it as a fact or an assumption, but it's an area that we believe we need to investigate. Because all that's going to inform what you need to test. Um, so I'll just brush over this very quickly. Um, we use assumption mapping to um, identify the areas that we need to test first, the height and most important areas that need to be right or we need to fine tune in order for um, products to succeed. And those tend to be up in the top right there. You can see it gets a bit heavy. Um, yeah, so they quickly identify what needs testing and so that you can design different tests or design different artifacts to, to validate them. Uh, number seven, ideate together. Um, we believe this is extremely important, especially for shared ownership of the, of the ideas and the product, um, being able to communicate the value of it. Um, it's not about coming with a brief, throwing it over the fence, and the designers will come back and say, here you go, with the grand reveal. We don't believe that is a, a good investment in time. Um, it, it does take the whole team to come up with the best ideas. Creativity, we believe, can come from anywhere. Um, and it's about short, sharp, and lean ideation sessions. So it's not that drawn out, um, huge discussion around things. It's about quantity when you're doing the ideation because there are no bad ideas yet. Um, we use something called how might we statements. Um, so how might we solve this problem in this way, uh, which is basically a way to like, funnel and, and, and focus the, the creativity to a specific problem, but we also keep them broad enough so that um, it's not specific to uh, a screen or a, an idea that already exists. It might be something, a completely different service. Um, an ideation exercise, I just wanted to point out, there's plenty you can use, but Crazy Eights is a cool one because um, it's very short, it's sharp, it's about like quantity of idea generation. It breaks down any barriers of like artistic capability. Two examples here, one's done really low fidelity drawings, the other one is simply taking notes. It's about communicating those ideas so that in the room you can have that discussion. No bad, no bad ideas yet, as I said. Um, so we believe in using inclusive ideation methods that will break down comfort and capability barriers for maximum output. Uh, number eight, test and validate. Um, obviously, and this is by no means like a chronological order of things. Number eight, we have it here, um, but it's, it's about perpetual learning. It's nonstop throughout the entire project. Um, start off, I guess, if it's a space we're not too sure about, contextual interviews with um, I guess in the um, health space, um, uh, patients, and specialists, or even host, you know any sort of staff within an area, because um, you need to understand those users, you need to understand the context that this product is going to be used in. A uh, great example with, um, I can't remember exactly which product it was, one of the health products, but we realized there was no point in designing for tablet view because it didn't fit in specialist pockets. They couldn't carry it around with them. Um, we realized quickly in another one uh, that uh, we had to put a logo on the back of the iPad because it looked like the doctors were just texting. When they were. So all these sort of strange things can pop up. Um, and it's about validating those assumptions. And also, you're always going to learn something. new. So we use rapid prototyping. There's tons of different tools you can use to get those prototypes in people's hands. High fidelity, low fidelity, depending on what you're trying to test. Uh, if there's any technical or um, development issues or areas that we're unsure about, we'll just do a little spike there. It's a time box thing, so we don't waste a, uh, a lot of time trying to um, solve something that could have been done in a different way. Because um, we believe you'll never learn more than by testing in the actual user context with real users. Uh, if you take older play as an example, we have um, in this picture here, this is a real picture from older, older Hay, um, a patient testing with the specialist. So the designers aren't actually the ones doing you know, the, the interview or the testing. It's putting it into the hands of the users and simply being observers. Um, and I think it's worth calling out as well that like we, we have a lot of experience in this space and we're aware of the sensitivity of a lot of these moments. 
Um, and we have a lot of learnings around how uncomfortable they can actually be for both the patient um, and even the product team because they're thrust into environments that are probably very unfamiliar with. Um, and of course, it's very important that before these moments take place that everyone is aligned. And that's around the transparency of information again um, on those sensitive parts and, um, and what, what we should and shouldn't say could be. Um, number nine, um, it's a pretty obvious one, but sometimes it's a bit hard with, with certain um, stakeholders, is just be true to the learnings. Um, kill your darlings, it's a classic, um, because at the end of the day, the data doesn't lie. We've done a lot of research, we've discovered a lot of new things that we didn't understand or know before. And to that point, be prepared to be surprised. Um, from some of the projects we've worked on, we've learned um, that the problem we're solving for was not the most important problem we should solve for. Um, so I guess speaking to the startup culture, there's always the opportunity to, to pivot and change the um, value prop based on what you learn. Um, and yeah, of course, decouple yourself from your ideas. We talked about shared ownership of ideas and product team really owning um, and understanding what you're trying to achieve. And through that culture, the idea is that um, no one needs to be precious about that's my idea because it's no one's idea not the person you're assessing, it's simply the idea and its value. Um, we talked about value pro um, uh, assumptions mapping before, um, and so you need to be able to synthesize that data in different ways to understand whether or not those important um, assumption, assumptions are actually true. So getting those insights, that, verba that verbatim and all those observations, and, and aligning and discussing on them, um, and then like, identifying the next steps. So if it's that important that we get it right, if it's false, then we need to do another iteration. Get it right, if it's, if it, if it's false and we don't need it, then we toss it. It's true. Uh, number 10, um, it's only two more. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, be real about scope in the MVP. Um, I think ever, it's, it's really easy to want, want it all now, um, but there's, with every project, there's real budget constraints and time constraints um, that we need to just be realistic about. Um, and that's, of course, unpacked through transparency and discussion. Um, so no point trying to do more than what is actually possible. Um, define that minimum viable product, which I'll, I'll show in a second. And, and it's about bang for the buck. So there might be some product ideas that actually um, enable other ones. And being able to understand and align on where that bang for the buck is is important. So we'd looked at the uh, older play product backlog before, and you might not have seen it, but there's a line running across that, um, which is the minimum viable product uh, line. Um, and having everything visible in this way is just a really um, great way to comprehend and, and align on exactly what, what needs to be done. Um, as you can see, it's not at all by any means the bulk of the ideas, but these are the, these are the ideas that absolutely have to go into that product. Uh, last but not least, measure success in, and improve. Often this is overlooked because um, a product needs to launch, not land at the end of the day. Um, so you need to prioritize what you need to learn. You do that throughout the product, um, identifying that, OK, we have this thing we don't know, but we probably don't need to like, comb it out now. It's about getting that in people's hands. And that's probably the only way to learn it. Um, qualitative and quantitative um, data. Uh, qualitative being user insights. Um, different behavior, different um, feedback, uh, quantitative, you might send out surveys, different analytics on how the, the product is working and how people are using it. And then you've got to analyze that data again and prior reprioritize. Um, and I think the biggest point here is just to allow for product improvement. Sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's something that everyone really, really wants to do, but at the end of the day, there might be a, just a very short-term vision, a bit like Australian politics, that we just need to get it there, and then we'll be OK. Sorry for um, but yeah, and like so, identifying those success metrics and prioritizing them is something you'll do with the, the the PO, I guess, in particular, or the client very closely. But of course, the whole team should input on that. Um, a very good PO will know how to do this uh, like intuitively and um, be able to sort of set it up and put it in the backlog, etc. Um, so it's about identifying metrics for success that reflect product impact, and then you prioritize the backlog. So that was a lot to take in, but I guess if you were to break it down to three key takeaways, similar to um, what Abe and Ben have said, uh, team's transparency and shared ownership is extremely important. Uh, test and learn in small increments, always improving. Um, and be delivery focused, 
uh, and realistic uh, with product scope. So we're us too. Thanks for having us. Um, that's my email if you want to hit me with any more questions, and I'll be hanging out after this. So thanks. Thank you, uh, Joel and Simon. Some really great points there, and I think you were kind of um, touching on a few things for health professionals that are really key, and some of those things were about putting the patient at the centre of what you do, but also that short-term kind of political angle speaks to us in health, so um, you really speak the same language. Um, so I'll throw to our audience for questions. Were there any questions from the group here today? How about from online? question that comes from that from the um, streamers is what are some ways you build team culture at us two? Um, well, we start every product uh, and every project with a with a kickoff, um, where everyone's in the same room. We get as many stakeholders as we can into that, um, and it's about pure alignment. We have a, a robust process and um, different uh, icebreakers, basically. Um, that's that's how we like to start the projects initially. Um, the other one is co-location. Um, being in the same room is is extremely important for just that like casual collaboration. Um, Celebrating success, we, we of course like to um, have a good time at the end of the day, so we have a good social aspect to things. Um, and I think, yeah, primarily, I guess the thing that resonates throughout is that sense of shared ownership. So um, a lot of the time when we work with uh, freelance developers or engineers, they, um, they're really shocked when they're invited into creative and ideation moments, um, usually used to getting some specs and just like nutting it out. But like I said before, we believe that um, creativity can come from anywhere, um, and it often does. So yeah, I think it's not, at the end of the day, that sense of shared ownership is the most important. Um, do you have a recommended prototyping tool? Uh, yeah, that would be Envision, without a doubt. It's um, a great uh, design tool for many, many reasons, um, but in terms of like shooting prototypes out quickly and iterating them actually in real time in testing environments between testing sessions um, is pretty hard to beat. Um, we have an app, and I just went into the app store to look at when we launched this one. Sad to say, it's launched in 2011, so it's quite old. It's in the diabetes space, and it's something that's used in day to day management of diabetes. Um, we obviously have updated it from the content point of view, but when we go into it, it's now, it doesn't have um, the sort of features that perhaps an app that you provide today has. Have you done any work where you've looked at some of the old health apps and sort of brought them into the, the sort of more um, tech space? Um, specifically for health apps, I'm not in. Not off the top of my head. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense to, to do that, but um, where we tend to focus is um, around the product strategy and, and new products. Um, I think it's it's a real challenge to do that because you, you're jumping into a team and um, they might have their own established ways of working, um, different ideas about what the product should and shouldn't do. So it's a, it's a much bigger challenge than starting a new team creating that new enthusiasm and new culture. Um, not to say that it's beyond doable, um, but it does require, like there is actually like a fair bit more overhead on, on those types of projects. Um, that needs to be acknowledged straight up. Um, it's not the same as simply going and creating something new. Um, having said that, like we do have like some pretty robust ways of, of doing that. Like in financial sector, we have history, like reviewing their products and um, helping them identify a path forward. Um, and uh, we do that through a lot of like just audits and um, uh, it's a very similar process. It's around doing that research and understanding the users. What are the pains, gains and um, jobs that need to be done? 
I guess everyone's familiar with that. And um, yeah, I think it's uh, it's just it's a little bit more um, around that team culture and and um, transforming that culture in order to achieve whatever new goals you think there might be. Jump in very quickly. There's a there's a concept called progressive disclosure, and what I tend to see in the health um, sector is there's a lot of amazing information, potentially a lot of functionality, but it's thinking about what the user needs and at what point. So when we started working with Moon Notes, they had a raft, almost too much um, things in that app, and it was about kind of taking a step back and thinking about when do you uh, release or allow for that functionality to, to come out at the right times. So that's just a, a bit of a common theme I think we see when we, we sort of uh, tend to pick up health stuff. Thank you both very much for your time. Thank you. Okay, just while I'm sorting out the tech here, hoping I pop back up on the screen. I'd like to welcome our second last speaker for the day. Uh, is Ben Wright, the Chief Innovation Officer for Cicada Innovations? It's like I've completely broken the system here, um, but I'm buys me a bit of time for the introduction. So Ben is the Chief Innovation Officer and Head of Investment Strategy at Deep Technology Incubator Cicada Innovations. And Cicada focuses on commercialising science-based innovation and has been doing so alongside its university stakeholders for 18 years, resulting in 14 exits or business sales. The most recent of which was a $330 million sale of a biomaterials company to Allergen. And Ben is also the director of the New South Wales Health Funded Medical Device Commercialisation Training Program, a program designed to improve commercialisation capability in clinicians and medtech researchers. Graduates have raised $41 million to commercialise their technologies over the past four years. So please join me in welcoming Ben. has been informative for you. Um, what I'm going to talk about for the next short little while is commercialization. And often commercialization is thought of commercialization is thought of as a dirty word in the health system. Right? Because you want to deliver better health care, you don't necessarily want to make a lot of money out of doing it. <coughs> the reality, however, is that commercialization is an enabler. The only way that you can sustain a product that delivers value to a customer is if somebody is willing to pay for it at some point. Right? You need to be able to make money out of it. And so rather than focusing on app development itself, this chat is going to be about commercialization and what are some of the factors that you need to consider when you're commercializing. <coughs> Number one is about impact. It doesn't matter what your technology is. No one actually cares about your app. No one cares about the buying tool. They don't care about your new stamp. They care about the outcome. So what solution are you providing to people? Is that generating the necessary impact so that they'll pay for it? So it's Carter Innovations. Uh, we're a university owned. We're owned by four universities. And we do the training for New South Wales Health and Commercialization. And often we're approached by clinicians to say, I have this amazing idea. The technology is just stunning. You've never seen anything like it. It's world class. Everyone's involved. I'm highly educated. I know what I'm doing. I'm an expert in my field. And I have a business plan to so design it. You know, build it and not yourself. Uh, and so my question here is what can go wrong? What are the considerations in a scenario like this? Commercialization is really hard. I can't say that out loud. Commercialization is really hard work. The people that are involved in early stage commercialization their blood, sweat, and tears into their idea and making that a reality. But the 
the reality is that 97% of startups fail. That's the key. It's a big number. And they fail for three primary reasons. The largest of which is the market doesn't want what you've got. So you're building the wrong product. I'm pretty sure this was addressed in the last, um, last session. But essentially, you're not leading the market leading. Which means you haven't gone out and asked customers exactly what they want. So understanding who your users, choosers, payers, influencers, and blockers are in the health system. And you'll be exposed to all of them. Often in a consumer product, they're the same person. Or one or two individuals. Within health services, you've got patients, their families, GPs is the first point of contact. Hospital administrators, uh, specialists, health insurers, government <laughs> regulators. There are a lot of parties who have a say in this. You need to be able to understand where the value is being put in The second reason startup fails is they run out of cash. So they exangulate, right? they believe themselves so right. Uh, that's because the funding landscape in Australia for NetTech is quite small. Limited funding pool. And it's because people waste a lot of money learning how to be an entrepreneur. First startup normally fails. And it fails because you're developing new skill sets on somebody else's team. And the third reason, and it's really the, the central reason that startup businesses fail, is they don't have the right team. They don't have the right team today. You may need a different team in three years time. It's the team today that matters. Because with the right team, you can go out and address the market shortages to understand the market need and do all of that exploration and customer discovery. With the right team, you go out and find capital. And you can develop that product from an idea into something good. But you need to identify your customers. You need to get really close to it. And I mean, you need to understand what time means they work. What time they get up, what sporting teams they follow, what they eat for breakfast. The better you know your customer, the easier it is to serve that customer and solve a problem for them. It's also easier to find that customer. So it makes it a lot cheaper to access. So your channels to market and your marketing activities have reduced costs to understand your customer really is. So coming back to the concept of users, choosers, and payers, identifying who is the economic buyer of that technology and who influences its use. It takes a village to raise a child. One of the challenges I see, particularly in working with clinical specialists, is that they are very, very smart. They are experts in their field. So they think they can this you need to reach out to specialists with experience in all different facets of business in order to make it The success rate for the failure rate for startups is 97%. The sole founder of startups is closer to 99%. So find somebody who believes what you're passionate about solving the same problem. Think about that. I'm not passionate about the technology, but about saving, solving the same problem. Because you may find that the technology is a poor fit, you need to really go for it. IP does more. Um, less so from an app developer perspective, i.e., you don't necessarily need to think um, by a chemical marker. But understanding what is defensible about your technology. Your service offering is important. So, what do you do that is different to everybody else that you can protect in some way? You protect it through building a rapid customer base. You protect it through copyright rights. You protect it through patents. So think about what you do different and how you can protect that competitive advantage. It also enables you to get funded, both internally from the government. So, also external So again, no one cares about the technology. 
structure also becomes a bit more tricky. And I say this from a governance perspective, because once you step outside of working in a team within health, into building a business, the governance becomes really important. The way that you share the equity for the shareholder in that business becomes really important. Changing from being a vegetable to not. It can also drive behavior. So if you partner with somebody, you start a company and take 50% of the company each and you make quit. It's actually really hard to get that other business back. So you need to set up structures that anticipate when things go bad. It's always when things go bad that infrastructure seems to be really If everything's working, no one cares. But don't be precious to that. And right here, learn to let it go. Because it takes a village to raise a child, you need to be able to bring other people in and way you can incentivize them to provide them with a good of money. <coughs> but make sure you sign for up. Again, coming back to the structure type stuff. Because what you're entering into is a marriage. Whether you're doing it internally or whether you're uh, signing up to the development company to help you build that product. You need to sign a contract with a shareholders agreement or a contract with uh, the app developer. And it protects you when things go that. And then you're an expert, but not necessarily in business. So, uh, particularly in, in uh, for all the specialists, it's been 20 years, 30 years, learning how to build a better healthcare, not how to run businesses. So, when it takes a village, you should go out and find a village that have run businesses before you can And listen to them. Because the, the contract is to expect somebody who's been working 30 years in business to go and look out for the no one expects that. It often reverses the expectation. I think it's not the worst thing. But be aware of both. Medical practitioners are one of the most ripped off groups by consultants. So do your due diligence on the people who choose to work. There are a raft of consultants out there that will happily take your money. Um, based on a promised product that you will make work, but we've never actually done that. So do you do diligence, go and talk to people that you've worked with before, actually do a proper reference check. And ask what happened with that uh, consultant when things went bad. Everyone's happy to talk about sunshines and rainbows, but what happens when things go bad? How do, how do those individuals behave? Uh, it may be your role, but it may be your role. So you might have a really great idea, but by the time you've got other stakeholders involved, whether it's the Department of Hospital or the local health district, New South Wales Health, investors, um, you've got clinicians helping you, you don't own it anymore. It's a shared experience. So again, don't be precious about your idea. Learn to listen to other people. They're out there trying to reach and achieve an impact, deliver value, and it may not be through the way that you set out. So learn to lose control of the solution. Once you start a business, it's an office relationship. This unfortunately has come up in the last four months ago. But I saw a founder of a company go and set up another company that competed with the company that also is saving the money for the company. It doesn't work like that. You may need a commitment to start a business. Um, less so when you're developing apps as an entrepreneur. You're going to be more familiar with that. In our companies, we need to be dedicated to that company, be passionate about it. We 
questions in the room and I appreciate those on live stream we're having a little bit of uh, difficulty hearing at the end of that presentation so we will make sure that we are um, speaking right up into the microphone so is there anything in the room um, anyone wanted to pose ben? <laughs> Uh, so we are a program that we develop. We have three streams where we help create businesses. We accelerate businesses in the We make a creation space uh, around the bank of the license commercialization training program. So there are a number of courses doing that for individuals who are not their startup companies. Uh, so we run a one day workshop to so like any three clinical trials. Are there any other questions in the room? Anything from online? Better. So multi-layered there. Um, first one is buy-in, so executive buy-in. Within New South Wales Health and the local health districts, uh, there is a lot of executive buy-in. We also see a lot of buy-in at the grassroots level. The blockages seem to occur at middle management, um, where uh, middle layer managers say, this is not about delivering health care anymore. 
you're looking to make a commercial gain out of this, so we're no longer going to support it, without the realization that it's the commercial gain that enables that impact. Um, so definitely at the top level, there is support um, from people like Teresa, right? but it's the middle layer that becomes the blockage. From an IP perspective, it's really complicated. So we triggered a New South Wales-wide IP review for New South Wales Health earlier in the year or the end of last year. Um, when you have, in particular, clinical specialists who are in public practice, private practice, private hospitals, and they're an associate professor at a university, and each of their employment contracts say that their employer owns 100% of the IP that they're developing, this becomes a challenge. So the results of that review are likely to come out uh, before the end of the year, and there'll be a new IP policy rolled out across New South Wales. Uh, Office for Health and Medical Research is also looking to establish uh, like a triage for intellectual property, and they'll, help, they'll start to help manage that process because at the moment they couldn't tell you what they are, uh, and that's a challenge as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you, uh, Ben, for that great presentation. And please uh, join me in thanking Ben. Wonderful. <laughs> Our final presentation today comes from uh, Zara Lord, who is here down in the front. And Zara is the director of UPage and is an eighth-year registered nurse and has nursed in several large tertiary referral hospitals, rural Australian hospitals, agency nursing, nursing in London, and volunteer has undertaken volunteer nursing in Malawi, Africa, and has now been in the intensive care unit at Royal North Shore uh, Hospital for six years, and it's a job that she's very passionate about and loves. Zara is a passionate public health nurse who has worked on both sides of agency nursing and understands firsthand the challenges that it brings and is grateful for the opportunities her career has given her so far and is now looking to create some positive change in the health industry. Zara is here to share her story, um, going from clinician, app developer to director of UPage. So please join me in welcoming Zara. Thanks very much, Dan and Gianni, for having me here. I'm going to start with a little story. When I was 14, I wanted to have a car of my own. I pulled a 1976 H.J. Holden Kingswood out of the dump yard of my parents' cattle station and I went to work on getting it going. I uh, knew which of the jackaroos were mechanical and so recruited them to help me understand under the hood. And after purchasing a $100 alternator, I realised that it was just a shorted out wire, which when we fixed, uh, she ran like a dream. The car had bench seats and a column shift, and I learned how to do my first burnout under the tuition of my godfather. I loved a project, and I loved learning new skills. And I wanted, if I wanted something, I built it. But more often than not, the building of it was the best part. I'm a registered nurse, as Dan said, and I work in the General Intensive Care Unit at North Shore. Um, I've been there for five years, and I'm very grateful for the opportunities that it's given me. About two years ago, I began to feel unfulfilled and I wanted to have a bigger impact. I am fortunate to have a supportive family, no major commitments or dependents, a secure job and income, uh, and a work schedule where full-time work is only three days a week. Growing up on a cattle station in remote northwest Queensland, we worked hard and Dad always talked about producing value. He knew that a happy, healthy, stress-free cow gained more weight and produced a higher quality beef at a lower time and feed cost to the producer. I was taught that a good business produces value to its customer. In nursing, there is an interesting dynamic when agency nurses, um, uh, with agency nursing rather, which I found didn't make sense to me or it didn't provide value. The, um, in a process where hospitals are charged quite hefty fees for the supply of agency nurses, there's no transparency and they have no choice. They can't utilise the skills of these nurses for they're not known to them. This leads to poor allocations and potentially unsafe nursing practice at the risk of patient care and nurses' registrations. And finally, the, the high fees cause some hospitals to restrict their use of agency nurses, and putting strain on the regular workforce. Contingency workforce is a reality to supply the ebbs and flows of patient and staff numbers. 
We have a growing supply demand gap in the nursing workforce that's projected to reach 25% by year 2025. So we need a safer, more sustainable, uh, more enjoyable uh, method of utilising the skilled workforce that we have. The desire to have flexible work options is not unique to nursing, with experts predicting almost half of the working age population to be a part of the gig economy by year 2027, a process that's becoming increasingly more skill focused with the likes of uh, companies like Expert360 and Weploy. I myself have done a lot of agency nursing on the side over the years, but I didn't want to construct a platform around my own experiences. So I ran a survey of agency nurses. I had just over 500 responses and the results were less than favourable, with complaints of a lack of respect, poor allocations with either confused patients uh, or in areas they have no experience with, no trust, frequent cancellations, and a net promoter score of negative 37, which basically means they don't like it at all, despite their higher rates of pay and work flexibility. If you want to survey your target market, look up net promoter scores. They're an interesting way of testing customer loyalty to a current process, and down the track, you can compare this with the MPS of your process. It's also worth understanding um, how to write unbiased questions so that you get quality data uh, in your research. When you're passionate about writing, um, if you're passionate about something, it can be very hard to keep biases out of it. So do your research on this and get someone external to check over your questions before you run any surveys or interviews. Change my slide. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I saw the opportunity here to cut out the middleman and I just needed to validate my idea. I continued to cut re conduct research for about eight months, trying to understand as much as I could about my two customers' needs, about employment law, different methods of managing payroll to create the value that I intended, and about hospital processes. And I started to mould my concept. My solution, you paged a healthcare workforce marketplace that profiles registered nurses and provides a direct connection with on-demand work. We allow the right people to make the most informed decision at the right time. We're not the employer, so we're not biased over who's selected for what roles. We're a technology solution, meaning our focus is on showcasing unique skill sets and facilitating skill matching to patient needs. We charge hospitals lower fees, reducing that financial burden and, and making UPage the preferred provider for on-demand nurses. Then in the belief that the best type of work is always going to be full-time work, we don't restrict the transition to full-time work the way the agencies do with their hefty recruitment fees. When it comes to sustainability, there is so much information out there, uh, but the best advice I think I can give you is to know and understand your numbers yourself. I could barely write an Excel equation when I first um, started out, um, but building my financial model has been one of the most powerful things that I've done. It helps me with decision making, assessing risk, uh, opportunity and planning for sustainability. And because I did it myself, I know exactly how to manipulate it from different perspectives based on a different set of assumptions. Um, and I can add new information in as I learn it. I did use a great blog to help me write this. However, the blog's no longer available. So instead, I'm going to talk you through um, the templates that I built. Um, so I took all of the market data that I'd collected over my re through my research um, and I set assumptions, which I've put in blue, so that I know I can change those numbers and it's going to have a flow-on effect in all 10 sheets of my model. I then total all the money uh, I've already spent and then that I expect to spend before launch and I add 20% to the expected project. Expected proje Let me start again. Projected expenditure as a buffer. I then take off any grant money I'm approved to receive and I'm left with a cash position at launch, which is a rather negative number. I then built out this spreadsheet in which, starting at the top, uh, I can set an estimate of the number of nurses I'd expect to register each month and it calculates my projected income based on what assumptions I've set around this. I then subtract all of my monthly sales and running costs to determine my monthly profit and put this against my cash position for a period of three years. I've built into my sales and running costs is headcount, where I project what staff I might need to bring in and what salary and in what month. These figures are automatically added to my financial model and this and added into my financial model. And this allows me to see the impact of these on my cash position and see what targets I need to be hitting 
um, before I can, in terms of income, uh, before I can take these roles on. Plan in advance as much as you can. Try and think of all of the possible costs that your business could have right down to the month they might occur in. Uh, I thought about legal costs, insurance quotes, uh, web hosting, accounting fees, and I talked to my developers about ongoing costs. The more you can plan, the more comfortable you will be spending that money when the time comes. When I had finished my financial model, I was able to duplicate those spreadsheets again um, from the perspective of numbers of shifts worked um, rather than numbers of nurses subscribed, and again to work out my burn rate uh, with no nurses subscribed or with no income, um, just so I could see the worst case scenario. So that's a really brief summary of what took me quite a long time, um, but it would be one of the most worthwhile things that I've done. Uh, in the end, what you project is based on assumptions um, and any information you have at the time. But as you learn more accurate information, these can be fine-tuned along the way. Before I move on, I just want to see if anyone has any questions specifically about my financial model. The last thing I'll touch on with sustainability um, is the Lean Startup methodology. Has anyone in here heard of the book, The Lean Startup? couple people. I found it really valuable for myself. It's a well-respected startup methodology and a worthwhile read. Um, Eric Rice introduces the MVP or minimum viable product, as the guys have talked about already, uh, which is the minimum core product required to achieve the primary core function without the bells and whistles and usually with lots of behind-the-scenes manual processes. I have a growing list of features that I want to build into the UPage platform, but until I've got people using it and knowing that it's what they want, I don't want to spend money on those things and it means that I can get to market sooner. Um, in doing this, I can build the product to suit the needs of nurses and hospitals. Um, so I found that a really worthwhile read. Today is about attracting the right people to implement the app, back when I roped those jackaroos in to helping me get the Kingswood going again. As a non-technical founder, I knew nothing about business when I started, um, or tech for that matter. Uh, so I talked to lots of people about my idea. If you're passionate about what you're doing and you're able to summarise it in a few succinct sentences or your elevator pitch, you'd be amazed with the offers of help and support and connections that come your way. It was through connections that I met my wonderful developers and was introduced to the CEO of Grow Super, a superannuation startup whose office I now work out of. This has put me in a big warehouse-like room with 35 developers, designers, finance wizards and the four founders who I take for a coffee anytime I'm stuck with something. Um, the people you connect with are so important, so fine-tune your pitch and really important to hold on to the why you're doing it because it's your passion that will attract the right people. There is a great startup community in Sydney which I hadn't really taken advantage of until recently um, when I submitted an entry to a two-minute pitch competition. Um, they had just over 100 entries and I was selected of one of, as one of three winners. So I'm now part of the Tech Ready, um, Tech Ready Women Accelerator for non-technical female founders. And there are lots of different incubators out there, as um, has already been talked about today, um, and they vary in what they offer from education to funding. And so shop around and find one that's relative, relevant to you. Um, also attend meetups and subscribe to Eventbrite, uh, where you can find a huge array of startup events. When it came to designing the app, I had been conceptualising it for a long time. Um, I'd got out some butcher's paper and drew out all of the screens um, that would be required. Luckily, I never had to show these terrible drawings to my developers, but it helped me to visualise each step of the user journey and work out exactly what would be required for that. Uh, I then wrote out my user stories, um, which uh, I was advised to by a friend who's in, in product development. Um, so stories use non-technical language to provide context for the development team. After reading a user story, the development team knows ex um, what is why they're building what they're building and what value it creates. Uh, when I first met my dev team and briefed them on UPage, um, they actually wrote out their own set of user stories, which I really liked. Um, it showed me that they understood the concept and I could compare notes that it meant that they were written in a format that the guys understand and resonate with. Uh, we used an agile method of development, which Meanings, means we were designing on the fly um, and the guys would put up a template and, and I could test out each element from a user perspective um, before they put any dev time into it. Um, this is where my nursing background really 
came into play as I'm a user on both sides. Um, so make sure you stand up for what you believe is best for your particular user's experience. Um, sometimes I'd sketch out what I had in mind um, and to guide the designer. It also helps to reach out to other similar users, um, so in my case, nurses and managers, um, to ask their feedback on it and get them to test it out as well. I remember getting my first designs from my developers. I was pretty disappointed. Um, I have a bit of a creative background and was imagining lots of appealing colours and moving things. Uh, UPage does not like that at all, and now I'm glad it's not. Um, it's, it can still look appealing, but the main focus of the designs should be to guide the user. Um, they need to be clean and simple and designed purely around ease of use. Also, some advice I've been given, there's no, in, no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, learn from other established websites and keep it simple. In terms of commercialization, I'm very early in my journey, um, but I've developed a bit of a plan on how I'll approach this huge and diverse marketplace. I have two challenges, uh, the first being the two-sided marketplace. I need nurses for jobs and jobs for nurses. Without one, I have no value to the other. Um, Uber manages the two-sided marketplace by incentivizing riders or drivers depending on who they need more of. So you might have seen recently all of the emails with $5 off your next ride because they're trying to keep the work up to the drivers. Uh, so that's my first challenge. The second is navigating the health system. Um, my passion has always been public health, as Dan said. Um, and, but in terms of piloting new software, uh, while the public system is becoming more progressive towards innovation, in my experience so far, uh, the private hospitals are more nimble in their ability to adapt because they don't have the complex ICT systems. So that's where I've started. I presented the concept along with a functioning prototype and slide deck to a hospital CEO I sought out for her um, industry experience. She was incredibly supportive of the idea and offered to pilot in her facility. So with a um, letter of support from her, I commenced development. Uh, we are several weeks into our pilot now and I have a second hospital um, ready to go when we get everything running smoothly. Uh, it's also been helpful learning to navigate the health system, um, including all of the different stakeholders um, and their roles, including you know, Health Minister, Ministry of Health, eHealth Innovation Network, right down to the facility level. Even though I've been a nurse for eight years, um, this is not something you learn in the day-to-day -day grind. Um, thanks to some good friends and connections, I was able to understand it better and was connected to some really wonderful and helpful people. So watch this space, big things to come in 2019. I hope that was helpful to you um, and to leave you with a few take home things I learned along the way. Mainly, hold on to your why, your purpose. This will get you through the tough times and help you to sell from the heart. Know your numbers, plan ahead and build your financial model yourself. Read the Lean Startup. Network, connect with people and get involved in the startup community. Draw out your screen so you know exactly what's required on your app. Keep the designs clean and simple and focused on ease of use. And learn who's who in the zoo, your stakeholders. Wonderful. Thank you, Zara, for sharing your story. Um, I know sitting down there I could feel uh, the passion. Thank you uh, for sharing that with us. Were there any questions in the room uh, before we go to those online? This presentation about how long have you been going for and what, what did you do on first? Yeah. So I started, do you mean right from the start? Yeah. Yeah. December 2016 over a wine. We, um, we started... Um, just talking about the opportunity and the need, um, but then probably more seriously from about mid to late 2017, so a while now, embarrassingly. Uh, we uh, And then the other question was what we built on. Uh, so we've done it in React Native and we've built a mobile, a web, a mobile responsive website. Uh, we will build apps with that, it's just not the, the initial focus because um, most hospital managers will use it from their desktop. Uh, but the guys have done a great job at making our website mobile responsive, which is challenging, I know. Um, and then uh, apparently it's quite simple down the track to build apps around that. So probably in the next two months, um, they'll add apps onto that using all the same source code, uh, which is pretty cool because it means that every time you need to make an iteration, um, then you um, it's just the one source code that you edit, which is great. And it's iOS and Android. So 
always interested in how you kind of get those first believers. How did you, how did you kind of convince um, your first hospital and your first nurse to give it a try? So nurses, luckily my network, but also I've had um, Facebook job ads has been has been quite successful. I ran a landing page while we were building the um, for the last probably three or four months of development um, and had 71 sign-ups to that. And then um, in terms of hospitals, I sought out this particular hospital because I know they used to use a lot of um, agency nurses when they first launched. Uh, I'd actually done some shifts there myself and um, the CEO was a nurse, nurse educator, nurse manager. She's been CEO of two hospitals. She's got quite an um, extensive academic background as well. Um, so she was, yeah, she was awesome. It was a fluke that I managed to get in, get in front of her and she was really supportive. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other any other questions in the room? I know a couple have come through online, so Lachey. Thank you, Zara. Um, I know from my own community, a lot of the other ones are meant to be important, but there's a lot of ideas out there that people don't really have the time to do it. And the questions come through about what what enabled you to sort of have that idea and then have the time to sort of do it. I think it would have to be the conversations that I had with people. Uh, I think it, I was surprised. But I think when you work in the hospital and you go for drinks with other friends or you know other friends socially, I don't think I realised what my friends did. Um, and then when you when I talked to those friends, they said you should talk to this person and I really started from knowing nothing at all and I'm still very much on that learning journey. But um, it's the people that I've been introduced to and the people that I see in my network that have been um, sort of guiding me as I go and telling me not to worry about this but focus on this and... Um, directing me in that way, I suppose, which has been has meant everything to me. Mm. Yeah. So not in the initial stage. Um, uh, full time for us in the intensive care unit, it's three days a week. Um, what I was finding as we've got further into it was when I get tired, you get imposter syndrome, and that was when I felt like I couldn't do it. And so it was in October last year that I just dropped one of those shifts. And if I'm having a quiet week, I can always pick up extra work um, in the hospital. So I found that flexibility um, really good. We're very lucky as shift workers to have that that, um, that freedom. And now I just have to not spend too much money so I can sustain myself um, on part-time nursing, which is fine. Yeah. So I wasn't re researching any patients. Um, none of mine has been around um, patient research and I haven't done it through any organisations. Um, so my research was purely done uh, through social media. I ran a, a survey monkey, um, a survey monkey's survey um, and was lucky to get 500 responses. Uh, I think I incentivised it with a $250 flight centre voucher. Um, and the, the results of that have been very powerful when you're, especially when you're, talking to hospital CEOs and they're assuming that these agency nurses love what they're doing because they get freedom and they get a higher rate of pay and to hear that actually they don't like it and they're not staying in it. Um, I was, you start to realise there was that real opportunity there. And then in terms of other research, it's just um, talking to my network and um, it's still running surveys. And one of the big things that the incubator, incubator program, the Tech Ready Women program that I'm part of, uh, it's just, they go back through all that market validation, and so we've done more customer interviews, but I'll be in a more structured method. Uh, thank, uh, thank yeah. you, Zara, and please join me in thanking Zara for her presentation. So that brings us to the end of today's session. Um, on reflection for today, a lot came out of that. Um, I think the, the kind of main themes for me were around the importance of teamwork, uh, culture, the power of networks, and always bringing it back to the why. I find the why is always the um, driving the driving force. And some of the, the words that popped out for me today, just interestingly, were around unicorns, Goldilocks, incubators, wolves, rainbows, jackaroos, and who's who in the zoo. So quite a diverse... Uh, range of words there that we don't always use in health, but there's our challenge to try and slot some of those in with our colleagues and, and see how they react. So I'd like to um, thank all of our speakers.
speakers today. Um, all of our speakers have given up their time to uh, meet with Gianni and I, prepare presentations, sign consent forms, answer my 453 emails. I'm sure I'll get blocked um, after today's session, but we want to thank you for bringing your expertise and your energy uh, to today. Um, there are a bunch of people in the room and online that um, will get so much value out of what you've shared today. So thank you uh, to you all. We will circulate a recording of the workshops and, and resources once we've got consent from all of our speakers to share those. Uh, and uh, we get the recordings from eHealth. But um, we would like to thank our networks uh, our New South Wales Innovation Network for their support in promoting today's event and for um, being here to, to help us out. I'd like to thank Lachey for coordinating um, and helping us get to today. She does lots of work in the background um, to, to help us um, run these kind of events and to our setup team today, um, Liz and Kay, you've been great helping us out with a few bits and, and pieces. Um, we'd like to thank Sphere who have supported um, this network series and you will know that Karen Joyner, the COO, was here at the last um, workshop. We couldn't make it today, but we'll be here at workshop uh, three again. And thank you to eHealth for live streaming and uh, their support. Is there anything you'd like to add? I just want to say the on? next workshop, the third in the series, is next Friday. We know it's not a great day, but it now is only going to be 3 till 5 p.m., the theme is on research and validation of your app. And I think it's a really great session because it doesn't mean you're necessarily commercialising your app, but it's about proving the validity and use of your apps.